Hello and welcome to the February 2013 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's monthly threat update. Uh, my name is Johannes Ulrich, recording here from Jacksonville, Florida. And as usual, we will have uh, two parts uh, to this webcast. First part, which is what you're listening to right now, is uh, covering this month's Microsoft patches. The second part uh, will uh, cover some myths in IPv6 to get you kind of warmed up for March, which will be our IPv6 uh, focus month. Let's first go over the quick summary of this month's Microsoft patches. I did add MS-13.8, which actually came out in January. This was the out of band in an explorer patch, which of course wasn't really part of last month's patch set, which is why I added it here. Overall, we got 12 new bulletins that covered something like 50 or so vulnerabilities. Five of these bulletins are rated uh, critical. Well, uh, six if you uh, count MS-13-8. The remainder was rated important. Well, let's go over it and first start with MS-13-8, the Internet Explorer out of a band patch. That one, of course, uh, was critical. Uh, we probably should rate it uh, now as a patch now, given that there is active exploitation happening of uh, this uh, vulnerability. The vulnerability was originally sort of made public via an exploit of the website of the Council of Foreign Relations. Now, uh, this is not really a targeted attack in a sense that everybody going to this website would have been exposed to the exploit. And that's, of course, uh, why it was so widely known then that uh, this exploit exists and how it worked. Once uh, that exploit was used on the Council of Foreign Relations site, then, of course, it made its way into other exploit kits, which uh, then motivated Microsoft to come out with this out of band patch. However, uh, the exploit itself uh, has been seen in more targeted attacks since December 2012. The real difference here is the more targeted attack, you would have a link uh, to an individual or to a group of individuals directing them uh, to the website that will then launch the exploit, while the uh, Council of or relations uh, attack was something called sort of a watering hole attack. You uh, do target a particular group of individuals, but you don't really have any control who is, who is going to this site. You just assume that people who are interested in foreign politics, who are involved in foreign politics, will visit this site. Another sort of lesson learned here is that you should update your browser. You should stick with the most recent version, not just within the version of browser that you're using. A lot of people still use in Explorer 8. Uh, however, we are now in an Explorer 10. Well, if you're using Windows 8, uh, you do have in Explorer 10 by default, but older versions of Windows frequently use older browser versions. Windows XP, of course, can only use in an Explorer 8, can't use in an Explorer 9 or 10. The reason why I'm saying this is that uh, modern browsers tend to be less likely to be vulnerable to some of these exploits just because they do include uh, some of uh, the compile techniques and such that uh, make exploitation harder. Doesn't prevent it in all cases, and we'll talk later about some issues where it uh, doesn't work, but in this case, uh, using Internet Explorer 10 would have uh, protected you. Now, then, in addition to this out of band patch, we also have a regular Internet Explorer cumulative update. This is the roller patch that we typically have sort of every month or every other month. This issue, in particular, goes after use after free vulnerabilities. All but one of the vulnerabilities being patched here is a use after free vulnerability. And let's talk a little bit about these use after free vulnerabilities. I have the URL here for a nice blog post that uh, covers them. But uh, really what this is about is 
the software, in this case in Explorer, trying to execute a method that's associated with an object that actually has already been deleted or at least marked as free. So uh, what happens here is that the memory content is essentially undefined. Uh, if you don't really exploit this, if you run into it, by accident, then typically that just means that the software here in an explorer crashes. A crafty attacker now could fill this part of memory with a code that's then being executed instead of the method that was associated with the now defunct object. So uh, one of the advantages of uh, this uh, exploit technique or this vulnerability is that a lot of uh, the countermeasures that are usually applied to exploitation do not apply. You're not really using a buffer overflow here. So uh, all these stack based protections don't really apply. You don't really have to do any heap spraying or such that is detected by some of the countermeasures. Th this makes this a somewhat uh, popular exploit a technique it's not as straightforward and easy to use as some of the other techniques the blog post here goes a little bit into what you have to do to figure out uh, where the right uh, part of memory can be found but aside from that uh, you will uh, see more of this I think and we already have in the past seen uh, quite a bit of use after free uh, vulnerabilities Next we got MS1310. This is a memory corruption vulnerability in VML that can be used to execute arbitrary code. Now typically this would be exploited via in an explorer. It is listed as a separate vulnerability here, not part of the Internet Explorer roller patch uh, because it's really an ActiveX vulnerability and ActiveX can also be embedded in Office documents. This particular vulnerability has been used in targeted exploits, so that's why we rated this patch now. The exploit is already available, even though it's not necessarily publicly known at this point. We got MS1311, that's a media compression vulnerability. It does affect DirectX, Direct Show. Those are the Windows components that are used to display these movies. Uh, the file formats, it affects our MPEG and AVI. We have had these vulnerabilities in the past, uh, so you may want to consider a more generic uh, uh, workaround in case there are any more vulnerabilities. However, the workaround here really is to disable this Quartz uh, DLL. If you do so, you will essentially prevent all video from being played back. So I can only see this uh, really being a uh, workable workaround in some fairly specific uh, configurations but you have some workstations or so where people really shouldn't or uh, where you don't really want them to view a video. MS1312, uh, that's a vulnerability in exchange. However, it's really a vulnerability in the Oracle outside in libraries. These Oracle outside in libraries uh, were patched uh, with the last Oracle critical patch update, but now software like Exchange in this case does have to apply this uh, patch. These libraries are used uh, to convert a large number of different document formats into a web displayable form. And uh, then of course other software will uh, soon see for example SharePoint is also affected here. This would exploit the server not the user viewing the document. So the way this would work is that uh, someone is sending a, an exploit document uh, to the user. The user uses Outlook Web Access to view the document but as the user views the document the server, the exchange server in this case would be exploited. And then MS1313, that's the same vulnerability just applied to SharePoint. SharePoint, of course, does display documents just like Outlook Web Access, and it does use these Oracle outside-in libraries. Expect uh, other software packages, not necessarily just uh, Microsoft packages, to be susceptible to the same issue. Everybody who has 
Oracle's outside in libraries compiled in to their products does have uh, this particular vulnerability. It's actually a fairly large set of vulnerabilities. MS1314, now this only affects servers in particular NFS or network file system servers. You don't have them typically as much in Windows environments. In Windows environments, we do have internet file sharing, which really sort of takes over that role, but it is available in Windows. And uh, if you have a mixed Windows Unix environment, then typically you use NFS to share files. In order to exploit this vulnerability, an attacker would first of all have access to the NFS share and the attacker needs to be logged in. Only read-only shares are vulnerable here and the denial of service attack happens if the attacker tries to rename a file or folder on a read-only share. I've used read-only shares uh, quite a bit in the past, sometimes for performance reasons rather than really security. If I have some files I want a bunch of different people to access, exporting them read-only makes things uh, sometimes easier, faster, because you now don't have to be as carefully with locking. For example, if these files are accessed by a database or such, uh, that uh, can be quite uh, useful. MS1315, that fixes a vulnerability in the .NET framework. We only rate this as important because it's really more a privilege escalation vulnerability in that it allows bypass of the code access security. CAS can be used to limit what .NET code can do. Now, there are two possible exploit vectors here. The more likely one is via the browser. Internet Explorer is able to execute .NET applications. These are these XBAP uh, applications or XAML browser applications. CAS will limit what these applications can do to the system. And then of course, bypassing CAS allows the application to do more damage to the system. It can also be exploited via malicious .NET applications that are, for example, uploaded to a server. Now, in this case, for example, you have a shared web server that multiple entities use to offer their .NET applications. You may rely on CAS to separate them from each other. And then of course, this vulnerability could be used to bypass this protection. Then we have an old favorite kernel mode drivers, not going to spend too much time on them here, but it's pretty much a straightforward privilege escalation. The user has to be logged in in order for this vulnerability to apply. And then the user would send corrupt content to some kernel mode driver and then gain system access. The next vulnerability we have here is actually very similar, MS1317, just instead of kernel mode drivers, here the kernel itself is affected. The vulnerability that's being used here is a race condition. That's something that you have in Unix sometimes too. Essentially what happens here, the kernel does set up a resource, let's say a temporary file, and then doesn't sufficiently protect it. So there is a small window where an unprivileged user could, for example, change overwrite the file, and then the kernel will use the content of that file in order to execute a privileged operation, assuming that the file didn't change since the kernel wrote it. So this is a how these race conditions typically look like. Not exactly sure how they manifest themselves in this example. MS1318, uh, that's again something different and interesting. That's a vulnerability in the TCP IP stack. And it's always interesting that we still have these vulnerabilities. Now, this particular vulnerability exploits actually sort of a property of TCP IP. So it's almost less of an implementation issue than actually a protocol issue. But of course, implementations can and in some ways have to work around these issues. The problem occurs in how a TCP connection is shut down. Typically, a TCP connection is shut down using the fin flag. So one side of the conversation, let's just say here, 
as an example, a mail client that is connected to a mail server will signal, well, I sent you all the mail, I am done, and it's sending the fin flag. That means the client will no longer send any data, but the server may still reply with, for example, deliver receipts or whatever uh, the server is going to send back. So in this state, the connection is referred to as half closed. The client closed the connection, the client will no longer send any data, but the server may still send data. Eventually, the server will send a fin of its own and then the connection is closed. What happens here is that the server or the other part of the connection is not just sending no fin, but in addition, the server is sending a packet with a window size of zero, which essentially means keep the connection open. I'm not going to send you any data for now and please don't send me any data either. So this now leads to the connection being tied up and as a result, you have a denial of service condition. This is very similar to La Prea. La Prea, if you remember, was the tool Tom List wrote in order to tie up connections being initiated by malicious clients. Now La Prea does this on connection initiation. So it does it on the SYN SYNAC. Uh, here it happens on the FIN. But the idea is really very similar. The odd part here is that Microsoft rates the exploitability of this with three, which means it's hard to exploit. I don't agree quite uh, with that assessment. Now the problem is that the vulnerable side has to close the connection first. And uh, depending on the application, that may not happen. And then of course it's not exploitable. But uh, really I think by understanding the application and by targeting a specific application, you may be able uh, to exploit this uh, pretty easily with a couple lines of uh, scapy. So I think it may be a one and a half or so in the exploitability really depends very much on the application that is being exposed here. Next, we have yet another privilege escalation, and this goes very much with the kernel and kernel mode driver vulnerability. Just here it is, the client server runtime. The client server runtime has a similar functionality and similar problems in the sense that the client server runtime is used to send data to the more privileged side of the operating system. If that more privileged side has a vulnerability, like the case here, then of course an unprivileged user could abuse this issue in order uh, to execute arbitrary code. The client server runtime is particularly used to draw windows. It's also being used uh, to initiate processes and such. So all of these uh, functions uh, of the systems that require privileges, uh, they always are susceptible to these privilege escalation vulnerabilities. Finally, we do have a vulnerability in OLE. Now, OLE only applies to Windows XP. So here, Windows XP Service Pack 3 is vulnerable. More modern versions of Windows are not vulnerable. OLE was invented back, I think it was with Windows 95 uh, that uh, first introduced it uh, to allow data sharing and uh, controlling of applications. Uh, Typical use case would be to embed an Excel spreadsheet inside a Word document. And that's sort of how it was originally introduced. And now within the Word document, you can essentially edit the Excel spreadsheet, or if you edit the Excel spreadsheet, it automatically updates the Word document. So these are kind of the interactions uh, you're looking for here with uh, OLE. Uh, in this case, a crafted RTF, uh, rich text format file, would exploit it. Could be done via Office or WordPad. Uh, in Office 2007, 2010, you can mitigate this uh, by turning off ActiveX controls in Office. However, you still have WordPad and WordPad uh, comes with Windows XP. I wouldn't recommend uninstalling WordPad, even though I haven't used it in a while. Uh, but it's one of those basic applications that you probably don't want to just uh, blindly remove uh, from uh, systems. Uh, 
So apply the patch and if possible, move to a newer version of Windows. Like I explained earlier with Internet Explorer, um, Windows XP should no longer really be used, even though a lot of people still like it. Well, with that, uh, let's take a look at our patch order. Uh, I rated the out of band patch here highest, of course, but uh, when we go to our next set of uh, patches was actually released now with the February patch set. The VML vulnerability is rated highest here because it has already been used in the in targeted attacks. Then we do have uh, the other sort of arbitrary code execution attacks that can be exploited via the web browser because that's always a very uh, common exploit techniques. 20, of course, only applies to Windows XP. Next, we have uh, the privilege escalation exploits. Uh, no particular order here, really. 16, 17, 19. Uh, there is no one that's really more dangerous than the other. And then, of course, 18, the uh, TCP IP vulnerability. Technically, it doesn't really apply uh, to uh, clients uh, because it does require that uh, the victim sort of listens on a port. But you know, still... Uh, I would rate it fairly low. And then of course, 12, 13, 14 really only apply to servers. Which then gets us to the patch order for servers. The Oracle outside in library issues, I rated them highest uh, exchange and SharePoint, of course, only apply if you actually run those packages. And then we do have uh, the denial of service vulnerabilities, the TCP IP vulnerability, that one applies to all servers. And then the NFS vulnerability that only applies to the servers actually running NFS. And then, of course, you still want to apply the remaining patches, but they're not as important for a server unless you regularly use your server to, for example, browse websites. Well, this is part one of uh, the thread update for February. Like I said, there will be a part two and we will publish this as a separate video so you can watch either if you wish uh, separately. If you have any questions, please email them to handlers at sans.edu. Or then again, if you want to participate in submitting data, isc.sans.edu slash howto.html tells you more about that. Or just use the contact form on our site. In particular, if you would like to send us malware or attachments, you can upload them via the content form and uh, it will not go through any virus checker or so that uh, may actually modify the attachment. So that usually works better uh, than using email. Thanks for listening. And uh, then, well, uh, talk to you again soon if you're listening to part two.